Growing Boulder is rebranding aging right here on public television. Get the launch pad to what's next in your life when you watch the inspirational stories of ordinary people who are living extraordinary lives. Growing Boulder shines the spotlight on men and women who are smashing stereotypes and proving that when it comes to living big, bold lives, it's not about age, it's about attitude. Saturdays at 9.30 a.m. You're watching WLAE, New Orleans Public Television. Crescent City Steakhouse, a true neighborhood restaurant operated by the Boykovich family since 1934, is the oldest steakhouse in the city of New Orleans. Serving only hand-cut, prime-age, corn-fed beef for over 80 years, Crescent City Steakhouse has become a dining destination for both die-hard locals and adventurous travelers who seek traditional, timeless New Orleans cuisine. Crescent City Steakhouse, 1001 North Broad, on the corner of St. Philip, in the heart of New Orleans. Max Durbus Realtors has been providing commercial and industrial real estate services to its clients for nearly 100 years. Since 1934, Max Durbus has been locally owned and operated throughout the greater New Orleans area, including the North Shore, Hammond, and even the Mississippi Gulf Coast and beyond. We focus on your commercial real estate needs so you don't have to. More information is available at 504-733-4555. You've heard about rugby, the hard hits, the whole no pads thing, but rugby is more than that. It's this, a whole day, a whole culture. Well, the fans bring the energy, so we better bring it too. Set! Every play, every match, for the city we call home. This is rugby, and we are Nola Gold. And welcome to Primetime Sports. Hey, I'm your host, Scott Alexander, and this is one of my favorite times of the year. Yes, we know basketball is wrapping up college into March Madness. The college baseball scene started, so we're going to start right there. LSU Tigers, hey, they took a loss to one of their nemesis teams from 2012 that knocked them out of the NCAA tournament. Stony Brook knocked them, gave them a loss this weekend, but LSU still moved up to number two in the country. I'm going to say this. The defending national champions, I think they have an ace, and it's not that you heard right now, the guy that ended the season really well, along with Paul Skeens. It's a guy named Luke Holman. The transfer from Alabama has two wins, hasn't given up a run yet, and this guy knows how to pitch a, ba a game. He's not just a thrower, he's a true pitcher. Hey, by the way, Nichols is also 7-1, along with LSU. The other three local teams, they're right around 500. UNO, Tulane, Southeastern, 4-3-3-4. Hey, moving on, the Pelicans. Hey, they had a great little run. They won eight out of nine games, and then they lost the last two. A little bit of a heartbreaker on, on Sunday. I was at that game as a, a twilight evening game. Uh, they had their chances to win this and they just didn't get it done. They had C.J. McCollum out. You had some depth issues because of the fight against the Miami Heat uh, a couple days before. So they had guys that weren't playing. So unfortunately, they did not get it done. But look forward to the Pelicans the rest of the way. It's going to be an exciting run for these next 24 games. So buckle up. Also, how about this college basketball? We, we touched on it. We're going to touch on a lot more with my guest Jack Benjamin later in the show. But we're going to talk about what's going on on the local scene with the, you know, the Southeastern Conference, the Southland, and of course the American as well. But let's go to the NOLA goal because they have a big opening game this Saturday afternoon at 3 o'clock. It's their first match of the season. They're going to play Old Glory. That's the D.C. team. Hey, this team needs your support. I love watching rugby. You will too. Hey, they hit hard and they have fun doing it and they have end up having beers after the game and they'll even have it with the fans. These are professionals. These are high tuned athletes. Go check them out at three o'clock on at the Goldmine on airline. Otherwise known as the Shrine on airline. And how about the NFL combine? 
My man in the back, you know Logan Graffy. He comes out here occasionally. Yeah, he has his podcast, Sports Etouffee. He loves this kind of stuff. And we're going to talk about some of the th guys he hopes we might get in the first round. Let's start with Florida State's Jared Verse. That guy's 6'4", 260. This is a defensive end. Hey, they're going to have to find the heir apparent to Cam Jordan sooner or later. This could be him. But if not him, hey, how about some wide receiver help for Derek Carr? A guy with some height. We thought Michael Thomas might have been last year. Brian Thomas, 6'4", 205, 17 touchdown passes. And that's still with Malik Neighbors on the other side. This guy could be dangerous. Michael Penn Jr. If you want to go the quarterback route, might be around at number 14. And a guy that I saw a lot, Talisi, Talisi Fuaga, the offensive tackle of Oregon State. You're talking about a real man. That's him. And if you want to later round, if you don't want to pick a quarterback early, how about Michael Pratt, by the way, for Tulane in the third round, maybe. And speaking of him, we're going to also have Mario Williams, five-star athlete coming from USC to Tulane next, right here on Primetime Sports. Can I tell you a cat joke? Just kidding. <laughs> back to primetime sports. Hey, we've been playing around with a lot of the other sports. We're getting back to what we love best in the South, and that's football. And nobody's done it better lately than the Tulane Green Wave. That's right. They went to two straight conference championships. They won one back in 22. They got this close in 23. A couple injuries kept them away from that one. But boy, they're keeping it going. Willie Fritz may be gone, but John Summerall has taken over as head coach. AD David Harris told you last week on this show when his first hire was John Summerall, but then John got to work, and he told me when he was on this show about a week or two after he got the job, he said, I'm going hunting for big stars, and we've got one today. Tulane had never had a five-star player in the history of their program. Well, they got three now, and we have one of them. Ty Thompson, the quarterback, he's going to come on in the next couple weeks. Also, they got the great receiver from Alabama, but hey, the guy that I've heard about for years, Mario Williams. And we're not talking the one that went to the first round to the Houston Texans. I interviewed him years ago. This is the receiver. He went to Oklahoma, then the USC, and now he's with the Green Wave, and they cannot wait to see him play, and neither can I. And here he is right here. Mario, yes, sir. welcome to Primetime Sports, man. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Well, so you've been in New Orleans now how long? How, you, how long have you been here? Uh, some months. About a uh, month and a half? Two Two months. Two months? Yeah, two months. Okay. Your first impression of New Orleans after being here two months. I mean, I don't know if you did carnival and all that, but what, what's your thoughts about this city so far? Uh, Mardi Gras was, was pretty fun. Uh, first one? I got here, yeah. Right. I got here right right on time uh, when Mardi Gras started. Um, the food, amazing. Uh, I've been gaining a lot of weight. Yeah, you got to watch that, diet. man. I mean, I, I came down, I was still doing some triathlon stuff, and I gained 40 pounds within a year. Yeah. I know you're training all the time, yeah. so it's a little different. But, yeah, that food will catch up to you. But tell me about Mardi Gras, because it's not just a lot of people from out, you know, from other places. I don't know about you in Florida, but that's where you're from. Mm -hmm. But they just think Mardi Gras is one day. But did, were you a little surprised that it lasts for about three weeks? Yeah, no, I was, I was surprised that, like, people, because, like, you wouldn't expect, like, I guess Mardi Gras to be going on, and then like my teammates was telling me, like Mardi Gras are going on right now. Like, <laughs> you probably want you know it. And then I was driving one day and I turned on the street, whole parade going. I get stuck in the parade, so I'm, I'm like, dang, yeah. So this serious. I went to uh, your NIL guy. He had a, a Saturday before Mardi Gras party, and I was mm -hmm. driving down Broadway. I mean, it was like girls going wild down on that on Broadway that day. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, yeah. I was like, my eyes were bugging. I grew up in the neighborhood, so yeah. I hadn't seen anything like that in a minute. But, I mean, Mardi Gras in general, if you take the wrong turn, you're going to be stuck in traffic yeah. for a bit. Yeah. Well, that's, that's going to be a lesson yeah. learned. But um, other than that, what was your impression of New Orleans before you got here? I'm just curious because, you know, there's a conception some people have, and some of it's true, but I'm just curious what yours was when you, thought, when you first heard the term New Orleans generally. Uh, food. You food. did know about the food, okay. Yeah, um, I, I I got a friend that went to SC. Uh -huh. he, um, he now at Louisiana Monroe, uh -huh. and he he's from Louisiana. He's from New Orleans. Yeah, so he be telling about he be telling me about it like every single day he was out there. Just have you tried crawfish yet? Because the problem. Yeah. Okay, the problem, did you have crawfish before? Yeah. Okay, because right now it's a bad season. I don't know right. if you know, it's the worst season I've seen, meaning like they're not really ready to be good because mm -hmm. I've tried a couple things and they were brown. 
Usually they're, they're great by now, but you might have to wait till once that gets going, there's going to be crawfish boils. You're going to see people with tables on with crawfish mm -hmm. pretty much every day. Right. That's what we do down here. Right. And when I moved away for 30 years, I missed that most. But what's the food you grew up loving in, in, in Florida? Oh, uh, so food. So love it, food. love it, love it, love it. I what's love your favorite? What's your favorite, though? Um, I like collard greens me and too. cornbread. Me too, me yeah. too. And anything smothered. Anything that's just cooked uh, for a long time. You don't like you don't like the like, you don't like the chicken when it's been cooked for about two yeah, days. Yeah, but I don't know. I like I like um, oxtails. Oh, you do like oxtails? Yeah, okay, I like oxtails. okay. I mean, you got to take a oh, I know long oxtail. time to cook those, but um, now that you're talking the real deal right there. Yeah, yeah. Coming from New Orleans. I moved out to D.C., and a lot of the friends I had, they were in oxtail, and I'm like, okay. And they said they have to cook these things for about 12 hours, mm -hmm. let it get soft. Okay, so as far as your decision, this, you're the number one player, and what I loved about you when I followed your Twitter and I was going down, at some point, maybe, I don't know if it was your sophomore or junior year, you were rated like maybe the third or fourth receiver in your class, and you put something, hey, I, got, I stepped up, now I got a couple more spots to go. And you had a goal. Like you wanted to be the number one receiver in, in your class and you ultimately got there. We have a list right here of uh, a group from you know the top receivers in your class and you're at the top and, and I look at the list and there's a guy named Marvin Harrison sitting at number 11 mm -hmm. who's going to be probably a top five pick. There's a guy from LSU, Brian Thomas, who came on this season and he, he's number uh, 17 I believe on this list. And these guys are now going pro after three years. It's hard to read, but mm -hmm. promise me there, Mario's at the top. Mm -hmm. Marvin Harrison from Ohio State. Obviously, we know his dad. He was at 11, and everybody's projecting him to be the first receiver, Brian Thomas. But a lot of these guys are still uh, finding their way. But did these kind of things, when you see them, does it motivate you anymore to uh, you know, say, hey, man, these guys are my class, and I, I have a chance to step up and do the same thing? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, big congrats to them. Uh, I know everybody process is not the same. No, not at all. So no. I always took that in consideration no matter if I was number one or 100. Right, so, right. So, um, like, there's no need to rush the process. Uh, I know what I want to do, and, I mean, I'm happy for them. And well, this is about on. you because I've seen this. I did seven of your games, which is crazy, working with for Fox. And we did two of them when you were a freshman at Oklahoma. You put up great numbers. Then you went with uh, the head coach, Lincoln Riley, which is not unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, there you are at Oklahoma. We got some great shots to you there. There you are with Lincoln. And then you you and him, and obviously the Heisman Trophy winning quarterback, Caleb Williams. What You mm -hmm. and Caleb were freshmen, All-Americans at Oklahoma, true freshmen. Y'all went over to L.A., mm -hmm. which is not a bad spot to be. And I did five of your games the last two years there. But tell me about that whole process of, you know, Choosing Oklahoma because your final five, LSU was included, right? Mm -hmm. Alabama, Georgia, Florida. I might is that right? I mean somewhere in that. Mm -hmm. And then you took you picked Oklahoma. So give me your give me your ride from you chose choosing Oklahoma, playing there, and then going to LA and, and what the thought processes were. Uh, coming out of high school, man, I know I was I was a diehard LSU fan my whole life. So like I was that's interesting. Really close to going to LSU. Me and Caleb, honestly. But, you know, uh, was that was that no? Okay, what made you that way? What, what team was it? What was it, the, the no? Nah, I just always liked your LSU. Like the colors when I was young, the, those colors stood out to me, and I was like, yeah, that's, pretty that's cool, my man. school. That's pretty cool. And I always just stuck with them. And grew like you would have been a kid when Honey Badger was playing. I'm trying yeah. to think of that era, like 2011. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So see, I didn't even know all of them yet. All oh, right. And then right. I was like. So Dang, just, I didn't know they went there. That's and I just used to like the school, so I always liked the LSU. So you, okay, so when you decide, because LSU was there, that's you're gonna be breaking a lot of people's hearts that watching the show, because we got a lot of Tulane fans, got a lot of LSU. But when you when you chose Oklahoma, what was your final, you know, thing that put you over the top over the, you know, the local Florida team? Obviously Georgia was on the rise, Alabama. We know what they've been doing. Uh, just you know. Um, Seeing what they did with their last receivers at Oklahoma, uh, Hollywood Brown, C.D. Lamb. C.D. Lamb. And, yeah. you know, and, like, just building a relationship with them and talking to them. Um, I want to be that next guy to right step on. up and And Lincoln do likes to pass. Yeah, so right. I was like, why not go here and make a name for yourself? So. It's interesting. Your class was really the first one that had the NIL. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, it came about the summer – 
before you started, but way after you committed to Oklahoma and signed. So it, it started kind of in the summer of 21, and you wasn't that your first year at, at Oklahoma was 21? Mm -hmm. But I want your perspective on this better than almost anybody's because you've seen how NIL has kind of changed the landscape because mm -hmm. you were there as a freshman when it began, and then now you know, you've seen it progress, progress, and you were at a place in Los Angeles, USC, where I'm sure there's a lot of mouths to feed, not just on the field because wide receivers – I went out there to just, you know the first game of the season and watched your practice. I'm like, oh my God, they have eight guys that could potentially be playing on the next level. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of mouths to feed. Do y'all mm -hmm. take that? Do you take that into account as a player? Do you think most college players do when they're looking at a place, saying, hey, my playing time and what am I going to get, and and how has NIL affected that? Um, I would say that like most kids now they're not really locked in into like getting developed. And I think that's where a lot of kids running into like a lot of like transferring. Um, I'll say like it depends on the person, really, right. because some some people may actually need the money and just be going for the money, and some people really want to take their game up to another level and understand the game and have better respect for the game. So I'll say I was definitely like one of the, I know I transferred three times, but like I'm just trying to find somewhere where I can get developed and be the best version of me, so. Just twice, and I'm all about this as, a, as an agent, let me say, former agent, I'm all about the player doing what's best for him because, mm -hmm. hey, the coach is going to do what's best for right. them. I mean, we know that. Lincoln right. did that to Oklahoma, and no, no slight against him. But I'm all about the player taking care of what's best for him and his family. And I think anybody that says anything otherwise is crazy. I mean, if I'm right. So I'll, the natural question next is you came to Tulane. And, you know, you've seen some success, and, you know, you played against them in the Cotton Bowl. And I'm going to ask you right now that after watching that game, and that was one of the greatest games, win or lose, I know it's hard when you're on lose, but win or lose, if you're just a, a non biased spectator, that was one of the greatest craziest games I've seen and I've, I've been doing this business a long time did watching Tulane in that game did you have did that that have any effect on you going there I at all nah <laughs> that that game was well past I mean but I mean I, you never honestly you hadn't heard much about Tulane I mean, listen, yeah no I that's, have that's that's my point uh, you hadn't heard much about them and I was gonna even ask you this tongue-in-cheek but when's the first time you honestly heard Tulane Green Wave Freshman year. That's what I was going to say. When we played on the first game. When you played them after Ida, right? Yeah. Hurricane Ida, and they had to play it up there instead of down. And they almost beat you there, man. Yeah. <laughs> that was crazy. Yeah. yeah, Michael Pratt. But so that's an honest answer. So that's my point. So that got them on the, in the thing. What made you decide to come here ultimately? Uh, you know, uh, it was a new coach, uh, Summerall, ended up getting a job. Um, and just like, like, so I ended up going to Cali. I was in California waiting to transfer, and as I'm going through the recruiting process, I was able to build like a relationship with Coach Summerall and the coaching staff. And you know, Colin D'Angelo, I I've been to him. He was recruiting me. Uh huh. Him and Coach Carter actually was recruiting me at LSU. Oh wow. Okay. When I was coming out of high oh, school. Oh right, right. I was close to going to LSU. Yeah. And so you had a relationship yeah. with those guys. Yeah. So I already had a relationship with those guys, and I was um. I was actually shocked to like reconnect with them. I was like, "What y'all doing here?" Exactly, and, right? And then, it opened your eyes a little bit to them. Yeah, yeah. It, it opened my eyes. Um, and then I was like, "Dang!" I really wasn't trying to go through the process, like the whole recruiting process yeah. again. It was crazy. I, I was like, "Man, I'm gonna narrow this down and really focus." How fast on, did you narrow it? Uh, pretty quick because I had to make a decision to enroll into a school. Uh -huh. Like pretty quick, so I had, like I said, I, I was in Cali. I, I had flew back down here, like flew back to Louisiana to um, do, take a visit. Yeah. Before the dead period. Do you remember that around that date? I mean, nah. I don't like mid December, maybe. I'm trying to think when that. Nah, was. this was recently, like before the dead period was over. Cause like I, I just got here. Oh, like January. Yeah. yeah. Right, 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 right. January. So it was like. I went back to Cali, packed all my stuff. I'm like, man, I'm finna go to Tulane. Like, yeah, I feel like this is the right decision, and uh, it's closer to home as well. Um, 
I just think this I think is the right decision. decision. Personally, I know Tulane's on the come. They're, they're, uh, my boy, Rocco. Right, yeah, you're already in with Mike's kids. I mean, I, yeah. you know, Mike and I go back to high school. Uh, he loves you. I mean, I talked to about you last night. And he goes, man, he's he's a great, great young man. He's yeah, I love amazing. Rocco, man. Yeah, Michael Rada. That's hey, coach cool. Yeah. You know, let me say there was a family atmosphere at Tulane, and they've built and they've cult they've cultivated, and I'm watching it, and. Fritz brought that in, and, and John Summerall, you mentioned him, Coach. He's a contagious guy, isn't he? Mm -hmm. He's got that personality. Like, I mean, when I first sat here, I, I knew five within five minutes why he was hired because this guy's a winner. You know he is going to get it done. So mm -hmm. I'm curious what his what his pitch was to you because obviously you, you said you had the connection with those other coaches, right, already. So what was Summerall's thing that put, him over, put them over the top for you? Uh, really just like his personality and his uh, – like he, how he's straightforward. Like he's gonna tell you like what's the right thing and what's the wrong thing. Like no That's matter important. what, what's the situation. And in this business, like you don't get a lot of that. So that was like very like special to me, I guess. I love that you said that, man. Because you don't get like, like you, you've seen it all. Yeah. yeah. I mean, listen, you okay. Let me just tell the audience real quick. When you're the number one recruit at a position. Everybody's coming after you. This guy had offers before his sophomore year in high school, like SEC offers. By the end of his sophomore year, every single school wanted him. They offered him, and that's early. So he has heard the pitches from everybody. Amen. And you just said something telling to me, Mario, when you said, hey, you don't get that from everybody. Because, you know, you. what is a normal, like, you can read through people, right? right. If so, like, how do you know when they're going to be ingenuine? What's your, what's your tell? Uh, they just give, give, give. Like their first thing is like, hey, we can give you this, this, and this. I, I that's I don't people really that aren't see, genuine. Yeah, right, I don't right. really see. I see through that. Like I, I could tell. Like if you just want me to have me, or you want me to actually use me and need me and help me become a better person. Right, right. So, well, that's awesome, man. Um. Like when you when you rolling through this, like what, what's your goal right now that you're here? Because listen, you got a new quarterback, Michael Pratt's done great things here, but he's going on to the next level. And surprisingly, I don't know how much research you've done. I think this would surprise a lot of people. Tulane puts out NFL players frequently, a lot more than mm -hmm. people think. Obviously not like Florida, Alabama, LSU, but they have a lot. So you know it can get done here. And mm -hmm. you know, a lot of running backs have gone in the NFL. Some receivers I know have been there. Obviously, they've had a couple first-round quarterbacks. You might not even know that back, in, you know, about 20 years ago, but still. But they have them. But point being is, uh, you know, you're playing. We all know you want to be in the next level. That's what we grow up as kids. We, all, mm -hmm. you know, I dreamed to be in the NBA. It didn't happen, obviously. But I mean, mm -hmm. you dreamed of being in the NFL. I mean, I knew you played some baseball too, right? Yeah. So, I mean, what you what you need to do to go make that next step and, and, and excel on both levels? Uh, really, just. Um, Focusing on me, like in my plan that I got, um, and not worry about like the outside. Like you know, um, I know a lot of people ask me about the Tulane and USC game. Like I'm like, man, that's that's well, just fun a for moment. These people, I'm yeah. gonna tell you that because it was a big deal. I know. Listen, the reason I knew Tulane had a good shot because I know a team like USC is not going to be fired up to go to a bowl and then they're playing with in their eyes because y'all were gonna y'all were. But to be in the playoff, playoff right? right yeah. yeah, and then, you know, you got knocked off by uh, Utah. Utah, yeah. Right, and so it's a step down. So I, I understand why USC lost. I mean, Tulane played a great game, but y'all not y'all weren't focused. This is like the greatest win in Tulane's history. Let's be real. Oh, yeah. I, Let's I be tell, real. Everywhere I go, my brother had on an SC jacket, and it was like, you go to SC? Right, like, right, 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 well, right. Well, Tulane just beat them. Well, like, Listen, nah, I grew up in the era. Like, USC was the school. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. They, I mean, the 70s, 80s. I mean, they were like one of the deals. And, uh, you know, they always put out the great running backs and Heisman Trophy guys, right? Mm -hmm. So, Tulane, I remember when they beat LSU 14 nothing when I was a kid. And that was the first time they had done it in 25 years. It was, that's, to me, this the, that was the greatest Tulane win ever until that Oklahoma win. And it was. Mm -hmm. uh, they went undefeated in 1998. You may or may not know that Tulane did. They still finished around top ten, but they weren't playing like any of the powerhouse schools. So right. what they've done now, and they're competing on a national level. They went to Oklahoma when you were a freshman. Oklahoma was two in the country, by the way. Mm -hmm. That game was supposed to be at Tulane, Tulane. because of Hurricane Ida. 
you know, Tulane never got to even practice at home. They were moved to Birmingham to practice, and they had to fly over. And I was doing a game somewhere for Fox, and I remember our game was at night, and that was a day game, and I remember watching it with a former Oklahoma player. And he was like, I said, Tulane's going to give him a battle, not thinking that it was going to come down the last drive. Yeah. But, you know, those are things that put uh, – that was like kind of the groundwork, you know, putting Tulane on the map, cultivated eventually by that game they beat you guys. So I know what it meant for y'all and what it meant for them. Two different levels, right? I mean, I wouldn't say two different levels. Uh, our mindset was to win the game. It's just I, they, they, they came out and executed and did what they need to do. Uh, I know we had a lot of uh, mistakes on our side of the ball. Um, and they, they was able to capitalize well, on it and take over. So that's what I'll have to say on that. Well, but. it's a 15-point lead, but it's like five minutes, right, or something like right. that. It, it had to be a perfect storm. The guy handles the kickoff and it goes out of bounds mm -hmm. at the one. There's a lot of things that happen, right. but it was magnificent. But as far as Tulane, have you gotten a chance to, to work out with guys? I mean, how, what, what's your camaraderie like with some of the new guys that have come in, particularly the other guys that the guys can be throwing you the football? Ty Thompson, I mean, have y'all had a relationship when, you know, he was at Oregon? Um, oh, yeah, we definitely had a relationship. Uh, I mean, Ty, Kai, the other quarterback. Um, Kai, yeah, yeah. Even D, the young quarterback, he, he's really good. Um, I mean, I spent time with all of them. Uh, I spent time with DBs, receivers. Well, that's Garrett Malma had, he's a, he's a former brother Martin quarterback. Have you met him yet? He, uh, he's a good dude. I, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're gonna get I've, to I've been yet. meeting a lot of people, man. When so does spring ball start for you? Next week, I think. Yeah. Twelve or thirteen? Yeah. Uh, how about your How about your entrepreneurship? Because I know one of the things that Mike tell me about, like you're a driven guy. You mm -hmm. like you like to do things on the side. I mean, I was looking at your Twitter back in the day. You, you were involved with the you know the wing business, maybe mm -hmm. at one point. I don't know you were helping promote them. Mm -hmm. But uh, what does the loot runner? Mario mean because you've done this since plant plant you know city high school and uh, right outside Tampa mm -hmm. talk about that. uh loot runner is just like go get it like go get the money like whatever you need to do don't let nobody stop you like just always think ahead and and that's do what you need too, to right? do yeah so when'd you come up with it or somebody give it to you um no nah, I really was just like when I was little I used to just mess around and come up with names. I like it. Like me and my cousins. And I end up coming up with that, with Loot Runner. And I was like, dang, this is actually like, it can't sounds go good, somewhere. man. Yeah. I'm going to say, you just came up so, with that yourself? I yeah. mean, nothing. You just put then, that together? Okay. And then I, like, when I used to be at 707, like, little kids used to come over and be like, oh, that's Loot Runner. I was like, <laughs> it's stuck. That's not my name, but we're hey, here now. Yeah, we're here now. So I just always stay with it. If a perfect ideal world for Mario Williams uh, for the next, let's just say for the next year, and then I'm going to go ahead and say the next 10, what would that be in your mind? Whew. Just ideal, perfect. I mean, like, you know, we're all going to go through ups and downs in life, right? But, right. I mean, obviously you want to be in the NFL. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what do you envision yourself? I mean, what do you, what do you think you want to do? And even, like, after, after football, you know, because, I mean, you're a smart guy, it's obvious, mm -hmm. and you've got other talents. Um, I, mean, I mean, listen, I know this is kind of a, 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 kind of a question people ask in interviews, but like job interviews, but where do you see yourself at? Because I, I look at you as a dude that's going to be successful in whatever you do. Mm -hmm. I, I really do. I've, I've looked enough at your Twitter and how you handle business you know, you, you, you seem humble when you get these offers. You're, you're, you know, like I, I think most people would be blown away by getting SEC offers before they even play their sophomore year in high school. And it seems like you've handled yeah, it pretty know. well. I mean, you know? I didn't even know I got those well, offers before. Well, I looked at the date. Sophomore year. It was, it was uh, September of 2018, and I know you played 18, 19, yes. 20, and you graduated 21, which is the, the – mm -hmm. yeah, so you were getting these offers early. Yeah. Uh, but – Let's even go bigger. Those were like Kentucky type offers, but then you got uh, even six months later in yeah. early part of 19, these schools are all coming at you. Yeah. Because that's not your senior year. This is like kind of your junior year stuff. You narrowed it down to five by your senior year, mm -hmm. right? And then, you know, LSU, Alabama, those were the five right there. I think Texas might have gotten out of there and you put uh, Georgia in mm -hmm. right there. That's commitment day when you finally did it. But point being is like, you're a guy. And I said this at the beginning, but like I said, the last time I, I interviewed Mario Williams on, on on TV was 
23 years ago, and he ended up being, uh, this was like two, eh, about 22 years ago, and he ended up going to NC State being the first pick of the draft before even Reggie Bush. Mm. But so maybe, who knows, in a perfect world. Hey, I'm, 2025 yeah. draft. Leave it up to God, man. There it is. Leave it up to God. That's the best way to do it. Hey, it's been a pleasure meeting you. Yes, and, uh, and welcome to New Orleans. Yes, sir. Appreciate and uh, I'm not a Tulane graduate, but I grew up loving the team. I went to LSU myself, so uh, if you had gone right. there, we couldn't lose either way. Right. But here, I'm going to give you, usually I give one or the other on the gift certificates, but since you're new to New Orleans, you got to test some of our food. This one's on campus almost. Okay. This one's like about, it's on Maple Street between Carrollton and Broadway. You probably know where Broadway is now because that's one of the main streets right oh, there yeah, on yeah. campus. But it's called, it's right by the Starbucks. Ask somebody with Starbucks. Shays okay. Della Shays. Okay. And this is, this is a premier steakhouse in town. Like this is top of the line. Okay. So for real, in the Garden District on St. Charles Avenue, where all those pretty oak trees are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's for that. That's Mr. John's Steakhouse. As for Archie, Desi Vega it owns a bunch of restaurants, and he is one of the owners of that fine place, and I love that place. Great place. And then you're going to get comfortable with these because once you put these, you're going to start burning your other shirts, I promise you. Task Performance, <laughs> the softest you. shirt you'll ever have. Yes, sir. Mario Williams. Appreciate it. Good to see you, man. Yes, sir. I wish you the best of luck. Uh, I, this, you have a great future, I promise you. I know that real quick. Hey, we're going to sign the ball, too. You're going to be the next one to sign on the two-lane helmet, the angry wave. Just find a nice spot that's that's clear so I can be able to read this in five years. Some people like do three lines and I'm like, wait, wait, who is that? Uh, anyway, I want to thank Mario. I appreciate him coming on. Um, by the way, we're going to have some NOLA goal guys because the season starts this week and I said that in the open, but they got training right now. So we're going to bring Cam Dolan, superstar on next week. But guess what? I've got a guy that I first met last week when I went to the Tulane baseball game and I'm sitting in the press box. His name is Jack Benjamin. And I was just watching the game from the press box, and uh, you know he was calling the game with Ron Sabota for television for ESPN Plus next. And I said, Ron, I, I'm just watching TV while watching the game. I said, Who is this guy? Because he seems good. I said, He's going to be the next Ian Eagle. He sounds like Ian Eagle to me. And I remember when Ian started back in the day. I was in Tokyo with Ian when he was doing a Nets game, and I'm like. And look where Ian is now. This is what I think about this guy, Jack Benjamin. He's been calling two lane games, only 27 years old, calling Nichols games. He's from the Northeast, New York, but he went to college out in Santa Clara. In fact, at his young age, he's already lived in eight states. Yeah. He's coming up next right here. We're going to talk a lot of college basketball on Primetime Sports. Good to see you, man. Yes, sir. It's been a pleasure. Appreciate it. Um, Rock and roll will never die. It's old New Orleans, my oh my. Come on, baby, let's go rock and roll at the city lane. Oh my, let's roll, let's rock and roll. Baby, do the rock and roll at the city lane, the home of rock and roll. This is New Orleans. You've been to games. You've seen the hard hits. Felt the ground shake. You've heard the fans erupt. And you've watched the team answer. You've seen sports in the city. But until you see Nola Gold, you ain't seen a thing. Welcome back to Primetime Sports. You know how much I love basketball. It is that time of year. We're getting into the last couple weeks of the college basketball regular season, even shorter for the Southland Conferences and the mid-majors because they start their tournaments generally a little earlier than the others. But you know what? You know my favorite sports basketball. It doesn't get any better than right now. I went to the game. Tulane lost a heartbreaker on Sunday. Went to their wave game. You know, I've been to UNO games. like the LSU game recently. I uh, like to support all the teams. NBA, I was at the Pels game on Sunday. But right now, I'm excited right now because the guy that's on our show right now, this, this show right here, Jack Benjamin. And I just met him less than a week ago. I'm at the Tulane baseball game. They were playing Nichols. And I went to visit my man Ken Berthelot in the booth, you know, just sitting talking to him. And, uh, and I'm listening to the guys calling the game. Of course, Ron Sobota. We all know Ron. He's been on the show. Former 
New Orleans Zephyr announcer, great New York Met, on a starter on that 1969 World Series champion. Well, he's calling the game. I'm looking over. I'm like, who's that guy with, with Ron? I'm talking to Ken. And he goes, well, that's Jack Benjamin. And I'm like, I looked at it, and I said this a little bit ago. He reminded me of Ian Eagle. And I knew Ian when he, I met him in Tokyo when he was working with Bill Raftery doing New, New Jersey Nets games. And that's 20-something years ago. Now Ian is at the top of his craft, one of the top guys at CBS. And I'm looking at the same thing with this guy right here. Jack Benjamin from the Northeast, right outside New York, Westchester County. And he went across the country to Santa Clara. We all know Santa Clara because that's where Steve Nash played, and they've become a great basketball School right there. There's Nash, and there's him interviewing. But Jack is, is carving his own niche, man. He has called 17 different sports now. He has worked the Tokyo Olympics. Pretty pretty big for a guy only 27. He was probably 22, 23, 24 back then. But here he is right now. He's he came to Louisiana. He's calling some Nichols games. He's calling Tulane games, and he's getting any gig he can get, and he's doing well at it. Jack Benjamin. Welcome to the show, buddy. Appreciate you having me, Scott. Great to great to be here. I've been a been a big fan for a while, so I guess a long time listener, uh, first time caller. Okay, how much do I owe you? What's that now? <laughs> okay, here's the wallet. All right. No, but I met you seven days ago, and I feel like I know you. I mean, I talked to you after the, the Nichols Tulane baseball game, which you did a fine job calling that game. It was a great baseball game. <laughs> and then I saw you. We talked during the week, and I saw you again at the Tulane basketball game. And what I loved when I saw you, you were doing two different things. And that's what I've made my career at. I've produced for years. I've been on air for years. But I, I've, give, I've taken any gig that will get me in front of a, a game or an event. I love being in events. I'm a nut about it. And, and if you tell me I need to do stats, you tell me I'm going to work in the truck. And, you know, if you tell me I need to bring Cokes, I may or may not do that <laughs> one because I've done it in the past. We all start. But you're doing that, and I love it. Yeah. No, no, I appreciate it. I think that my mindset anyone who I talk to in the business, all my mentors, people I look up to, they say you say yes to any opportunity you can take and, and any, any chance you have to meet people, to advance, to get better at your craft. And that's sort of the mindset I've had. And um, I think it's given me an appreciation. You know, I've done radio, I've done TV. I've, yeah, I've been, you know, in a spot where I'm doing stats. I've been a runner. I've been in the production truck. So I think I kind of know everything that goes into the production. I've got a lot of appreciation for all the people on the crew you know there's people who have a lot harder roles than me talking to a microphone and, and talking with my color analyst and that kind of thing and so there's a lot more than that that makes a production go but yeah I love sports I want to do whatever I can to, to be around the industry and that sort of thing and obviously calling games is my passion and I'm really lucky I get to you know narrate these guys and tell their stories and there's a lot of amazing stories out there to tell so I uh, know it's been a lot of fun again appreciate you having me on well I'm gonna say this because I love that attitude I really do, because I, I used to think I wanted to be, and it's a pipe dream. Rune Arledge was the guy, Monday Night Football. I was like, when I got into television, I started having a passion for creating things. That's what I wanted. But then, just by chance, uh, one of the coaches that I was, was, I was producing a show for, a studio show, couldn't make it. He got, there was a wreck, so they, <laughs> they threw me on. It was a live show. I had to do it. Next thing I know, that was 1996. I've been on air pretty much ever since, but I've done both. I've kept my roots doing producing or even some stats. I love it all. So... Here's the thing. Whether you're the next, say, Rune Arledge or you're the next Tim Brando, uh, you're learning the right way because you're doing everything it takes. And to me, there's some guys that when they come in the business, they said, hey, man, I, I don't want to hold that camera. I don't want to do that. I'm like, dude, you, you can't have that attitude. And there you are with the great Kevin Harlan, yep. who I've worked with when he was just getting going. That's how <laughs> long ago in the 90s. But you've been around some great people already. Yeah, I know. I, I really have, and I've been really fortunate. Yeah, Kevin was actually here. He was doing, I think, Saints Raiders last year. Yeah. And so I, I've been really lucky. There have been – we can go through all the all the mentors I've had, but Kevin's been one of the best. He's been one of my favorite announcers since I started watching sports. Before I knew I wanted to be a broadcaster, I remember, you know, being young and the, you know, no regard for human life. Calling, no regard him, for Him human calling life. LeBron James and all the – I mean, all, all those all I those remember great the calls. game. Yeah, but – but, but the th you know the thing I think that sticks out about him and you know Marv Albert's been a great mentor to me and uh, a guy like Dave Kane who's now the radio voice of the Bucks so I met when he was still at Virginia um, Ed Cohen who's the radio voice of the Knicks all those guys are better people than they are broadcasters and I mean Kevin Harlan is uh, I don't know he's he's an unbelievable broadcaster he somehow I don't know how he does it but he's somehow a better person a better family man his, no, he's his yeah his daughter Olivia now is doing great things in broadcasting he's been I know amazingly supportive with her she was just doing the Super Bowl in the UK for Sky Sports. 
sports. So no, he's been he's been really good to me. And I think any chance I have um, for a person like that, you know, for Kevin to say, hey, you want to hang out in the CBS booth? Kenny Albert was here for Giants versus Saints in the I fall. Saw some Kenny hung Albert out, yeah, hung out, right. hung yeah. out with Kenny in the booth too. Marv's so it's, son. Yeah. Well, Marv, it's funny because you know we he had a difficulty back. You we were probably a baby. Uh, I remember he did some Olympics, and I, I remember the first time. Mike, you're a New York guy. We all know. Yes. <laughs> and that's Kenny right yeah. there. But you have a shot with Marv. I think we'll find. But the fact is, is like he. You might not remember this. He had some some stuff where he was, uh, you know, he got in a little bit of trouble. So I went as Marv out for Halloween one year, '97, and I wore the the you know the sportscaster jacket. I had the you know the wig, the toupee, and then I had a bra hanging over my my shoulder. And it was like it had a microphone, TNT. But Marv, to me, he was already a legend. And this is 27, 28 years later, and he's still a legend. He's had a whole new life even after yep. all that and when you talk about your mentors and that guy is as good as it gets and being a New Yorker I mean how many Knicks games did you hear him call and when you talk about mentors I mean that's just a couple we're going to get to the Olympics in a second but who are some of the other dudes that you've looked up to yeah I, I mean do you think about the New York market think about who I had to call my home Knicks games Mike Breen you know, Mike, everybody knows Mike Breen he's I think he's called now you know 15 or 16 finals since you know 06 and I mean, he was my – he, he, he exactly, the bang call. He and Walt Clyde Frazier, that's the soundtrack of my childhood watching the Knicks. So I had them. I was always a Knicks – I was raised Giants, Knicks, Yankees. Uh, but I did – I would watch Nets games because Ian Eagle's the Nets announcer too. So I got him in my home market with those two channels. John Sterling on Yankees radio, you know, it is high, it is far, it is yeah, – that was – I grew up with that call, of course. Another legend. Uh, Bob Papa on Giants Bob radio, Papa. he was one of my favorites. My, my dad and I would go to all kinds of Giants games, so, you know, we'd, if it's late on a school night or whatever, or, you know, get to school on a Monday, you know, we're driving back, listening to him call the end of a Giants game, so he was a guy I'd listen to a ton. Uh, there's there's so many growing up that were, you know, Well, just, you mentioned Walt Frazier. Okay, let's yeah. stop there, because <laughs> as a kid, the, when I first was able to – watch basketball and understand it. It's really when the Knicks won those two championships early. You know, I could still name the top eight within seconds. But Walt Frazier, I've always said, was my, my second favorite player of all time, and I still say that, even though guys like Larry Bird have come up. But I went up to him finally because, you know, I was doing games from 93, 94, you know, for several right. years. And I would see Walt because he was doing Knicks games, but I was always too nervous to go talk to him. But after years of being seeing guys in a press lounge and going to what's up, what's up, how you doing, I finally one time after about four years, it might have been the mid to late 90s, I was like the perfect opportunity. I was you know I was going to talk to the refs, set, set the clocks up for the refs before the game. Right. Walt was walking over. All the guys are stretching, warming up, doing the thing. And finally I said, Walt, I said, you know, I'm Sky Yeah, you, know, you don't know me, but you've always been my second favorite player of all time. And he go, he looked at with that big smile. And he was the coolest guy. If y'all don't know, if you're under 30, you don't know who Walt Frazier is. Google him, ask somebody, because he was the coolest cat of all time. Best dressed guy. In the Best business, dressed too. guy. You know, <laughs> you might see him on Just for Men. Uh, he made that thing famous along with Keith Hernandez. But the fact is, is he goes second best. I've never heard that in my life. I said, who's first? I said, well, I'm from New Orleans. He goes, the pistol. And I said, and I was at the game when pistol scored 68 against the Knicks. And the fact is, is I said, well, dude, you're the coolest of all time. But when you get to work with your legend friends, I mean, the guys that were you looked up to, and then now you're not necessarily you're their peer yet, but you're in the same business. I mean, your colleagues in a sense. Isn't that the coolest? Yeah, no, no, it is. Absolutely. It's funny. You mentioned Clyde. I mean, he's been my dad's favorite. My dad is a lifelong Knicks fan. My dad was there when they won the championships in 1970 Holes, and yeah. 73. He's right. been a season ticket holder for life. So, you know, it's nice for me to finally experience a quality Knicks team this year. I mean, this is amazing for me to, to see how, how well they've been playing and Jalen Brunson and what they're doing. But yeah, no, to, to share the business with so many legends is amazing. I think that any time I put on the headset and, and we talked about all the people who have been mentors to me and that kind of thing, I think about them and I think about the path they've laid and I'm constantly, I'm one of those guys, you know, people ask me, oh, what, what podcasts are you listening to in the car? What, you know, I do a lot of drives, three hours, four hours to games and stuff like that. I, I was listening to Kevin Harlan calls last night, you know, on YouTube for 30 minutes. Now I'll, I'll listen to Mike, I'll listen to Mike Breen calls. I'll listen to whatever podcasts I can about guys and their past and their journeys and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's so many good ones that have, that have gone through this business. I feel 
feel like I, I owe it to them to do things the right way and to really study the craft and to hone in on how can I get better? How can I pass it down to the next generation? You know, these guys, I send emails all the time asking people, hey, can you can you listen to a tape? Can I pick your brain on something? And I'm, now I'm at the point where I'm starting to get emails from younger guys. Hey, can you listen to my tape and stuff? And I absolutely, if the answer is yes, I've had so many people in my corner help me out. The cool part about this business is how helpful everyone is. It's a true brotherhood and kind of networking. And obviously there's so many great women in it too, so I shouldn't say brotherhood, but uh, it's really a, a family of, and a, and a, and a right, great right, network right. that it is, yeah. I'm gonna say this, and I have to ask this question because it seems like you were born to do this. You know, you played <laughs> hoops too, I know that, but when did you get the bug that you knew this was gonna be your career? Was it as a kid like Tim Brando? Like he was holding the mic when yeah. he was like five, but no, when was it? It wasn't, it wasn't like Tim, I, I can't say that. So actually baseball was my first love. My parents, if I were to say that it was basketball first, I'd be lying, my parents tell you it was always baseball. I think my initial goal was to probably pitch for the New York Yankees. Right, that, was, right, that was always sure. kind of the target frame. I'm not kidding when I say this. I actually was playing travel baseball growing up. I was I wasn't ever the best, but I was you know one of the one yeah, of the better kids in the age group. Team, yeah, sure. playing travel baseball. Yeah. We won a, we won a couple of league titles or whatever. In about seventh grade, I threw my arm out. I was I wasn't even a starting pitcher. I just I think I short armed it. My form wasn't great, and my elbow went. I was doing like I mean, my parents say we would be in Mexico on a family vacation. I'd have my arm in an ice bath at age 13, like trying to no one trying Ryan to, over here. Exactly. <laughs> but there's something wrong when you're you know, 12 right, or 13 right, 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 years right. old and you're, you're icing your arm down. The career so path is not going I, straight up on I that I think one. I realized at that point, okay, baseball's probably not the one. I think basketball at that point when I kind of realized, okay, you know, it's going to be hard to make it as a baseball hitter because I, I had a tough time, you know, when, when the curveballs began and the fastballs began. Not I was easy. A, I was a pretty good hitter, but I, I, I just kind of knew it's going to be tough. Um, and so, yeah, basketball separate the men from the boys. Yeah, no, I mean, it does. It does. <laughs> they but, buckle you. Yeah, but basketball was basketball was the next sport for sure. And, and I think, t t you know, as far as like this craft, I always knew I wanted to do something related to sports. Right. There, there's no question that was going to be part of it. I think as far as kind of like getting the bug in terms of broadcasting and the idea that maybe it could be a career path, definitely not until senior year of high school. Like I can't, like when I was a junior, you know, most people as a junior, if you're not being a recruited athlete or someone who's getting a scholarship, start looking at colleges junior year. And when I was looking, the thought wasn't in my mind of, okay, what's the best broadcasting school? Because otherwise I would have taken a visit to Syracuse sure. and Arizona State and Ball State's got a great program in Muncie, Indiana. Fordham is right in my backyard in New York. And that's where Mike Breen went and Michael Kay and Spiro Ditas and all these guys. Guys, but yeah, I think I sort of knew I wanted to do something related to sports. My senior year summer, after I'd already decided on Santa Clara because of the weather, we've got I have some California roots. My mom spent a bunch of time out there growing up. I probably spent, great choice by yeah. the way. <laughs> the the weather's well, not just a problem going sure. from the East Coast, which you, you've seen all that. You got the yeah. whole different thing, and that yeah. You know, keep going well, with no, the thing. No, no, yeah. I think yeah, I think part of it is you know our family would spend at least a week out in California every year because my mom had spent time out after she graduated from college. My parents are both from the East Coast, but so we had family out there, cousins out there in Menlo Park, kind of near the Stanford area. We've got uh, family all over the Bay Area, so yeah, I think I knew hey, this would be great to get out to college there. And I, uh, I went there, you know, part of what I think intrigued me is they had a radio station at Santa Clara. But I did, uh, my, I was going to say my senior year of high school was kind of my first foray into it. There was this network, MSG Varsity in New York, and they mm -hmm. would do like local high school games. And I interned with the guy who would broadcast all these games. And I did like a couple of soccer games. And I'm like, you know, this is kind of fun. Maybe I'd want to do this in college next year. And so I arrived at Santa Clara and I knew they had a radio station. They had told me they'd been broadcasting some sports. I figured, okay, I'll hop in right away and start calling. You know, Santa Clara doesn't have a football team, but they've got basketball, they've got baseball, they've got all these sports. And uh, suffice to say, it didn't uh, happen right away for me. It took a couple of years actually to build the program from scratch at the radio station and kind of get going there. But to answer your question, long story short, not really until senior year of high school did I know broadcasting was kind of the way I wanted to push, but always sort of knew in the back of my head sports would this be. This is yeah. already going like, like I thought. 15 minutes and we haven't even gotten to anything that's going <laughs> on now. But I have to ask you real quick, and we'll keep this one succinct. How'd you get to Louisiana? Because yeah. you've been to eight different places, and now you're in New Orleans, and I see you calling Tulane game for ESPN Plus, and then you say you go down and do Nichols, and give us the quick domino as fast as you can so we can talk about what's happening right now in college Yeah, no, no, you got it. My, so so the, the basically, first year out of college, I was splitting time between Charlottesville, Virginia, which is where I met Dave Kane, Great who's now boy. the voice of the Bucks. Yep. Um, I had connected with him in college. He had an, an opportunity to do some games at UVA, and I met the SID at Davidson College, where Steph Curry went. Everybody knows about Steph and Davidson. He just got his degree there. So I basically would drive four and a half hours back and forth doing games at those two schools primarily, and other opportunities opened up in North Carolina and South Carolina. There was an opportunity at Nichols because of a complete domino effect. Basically, Sean Kelly, who people around here know well, the great job he did with the Pelicans, he left for ESPN Radio when he was with the Pels. Todd Graffanini goes to, to goes from Tulane to the Pelicans. 
Uh, Andrew Allegretta at Virginia Tech goes from there to Tulane. Bryant Johnson, who was my predecessor at Nichols, goes to Virginia Tech. Spot opened up at Nichols, and it was a full-time radio gig. I'm 23 years old. To have a chance to do FCS football for a team that had just won a conference right, championship right, in 2018. Right, yeah, my first year there, yeah, I got yeah, to call Chase, a conference yeah, title. Chase, and, I mean, come yeah, on. Chase, Chase is a good friend of mine. I love and so Chase. That first year was that, that crazy river ball game in 2019. Yeah, so 2019, I got to call a football conference title. Basketball was the two seed in the Southland tournament that year. I'm sitting in my hotel room, and yeah, COVID, had, COVID hits the, the Southland tournament. I love him. Uh, Austin Claunch was the coach. What's the next one? Richie Riley Richie was Riley, before yeah, him. Richie yeah. Riley, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, basically, to, long story short for kind of where I'm here, I got to Louisiana for Nichols, and after COVID, it's kind of transitioned into more and more TV, and I've done, you know, some, some different stuff. And I'd be remiss not to say the Olympics because that's a huge gig, and I, I said that when I introduced you, but talk about that. Uh, um, yeah. No, it, it well, was, I was going to say for a minute, I don't want <laughs> to cut you off because, but yeah, talk no. to me how you got the gig because that's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. I, I think, you know, we, we talked about me kind of going into more and more TV after COVID hit. And I think, you know, part of what I, what I tried to do is call any sport I could. I'd say yes to anything. A uh, producer at NBC back in, I think it would have been 20, summer 2019, my first year out of school, they had a last minute opening for someone to do water polo on NBC Sports Network and the Olympic Channel. And I said, yeah, absolutely, I'll do it. And that turned into doing some ski jumping and that turned into some other sports. Next thing you know, the Tokyo Olympics are up. They get delayed a year, and I get a call saying, "Hey, we we you know we've you've done some stuff for us. You've done it. I guess I did a decent enough job. We'd love to get you in some Olympics coverage." And it turned into doing Taekwondo and karate and so fencing. So were, were you in Tokyo? I, 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 I was in Stamp in the Stamford, Connecticut okay, headquarters. Okay, so they be, that, and it was a on a non COVID year. That's what year, they do a lot. Yeah, I don't know. A, yeah. a non COVID year, they'll have a good number right, of right, people right. on site. They had very very few people in Tokyo because the COVID. Right, and I was going to ask you because I did seven straight years NBA. If you remember, right. in the well, you you're a young kid. They <laughs> they would go do games and TNT was doing so that was one of the projects I had and I loved it and I was just curious if you've been because you got to get there before you yeah no I and I'm sure you will it's a bucket list item for sure all right so now about what's happening in college basketball because I know you love it as much as I do I say it's tooling game you're covered let's start with the Southland real quick because I mean Will Wade is doing incredible oh, things yeah. I mean the former LSU coach if you don't remember Will Wade was a darn good coach at LSU got overshadowed by what's now legal Paying players, yeah. right? But everybody does it in basketball. I'm just saying. I'm making excuses, but there's a fact. Will can coach, and he had the best record overall in the SEC, better than Kentucky in his years here. That's a fact. Um, now, what do you take after you're calling Nichols games? You've seen them all. Has Will got a great chance to take it to the next level uh, for, for McNeese going to the tournament? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to put it in perspective for people around here, McNeese lost 23 games last year. They hire Will Wade. Will Wade's introductory press conference, he says, hey, we're going to go from 23 losses to 23 wins. They've now won 25 games. They're one of five teams in the country who have 25 wins, which is unbelievable to think about. They've won 20 of 21. The only Southland team to beat them, Southeastern. That was on a crazy game in Hammond, and uh, they, they beat him at the buzzer. But, yeah, I mean, he's got a group that basically, if you look at the way the roster is constructed, Shahade Wells, who I think is the front runner for Southland Player of the Year, yeah. is a guy who was at TCU. He, he was at UT Arlington. He's got a lot of experience. Christian Shoemate's a guy who's been around the program. Who's on? He's, the guy's on Sports Center literally every night. You'll, right. If you just type in Christian Shoemate, you'll see how many dunks they have. But he's got a really veteran group of guys who've done it. And you got a coach who's been to a Sweet 16. He's been, I think, six or seven NCAA tournaments. They've they've got to win two games in their home floor. Remember the tournaments in Lake Charles? Yep. They're 14 yep. and 0 at home. They got a great chance yeah, to, and, to and win. The yeah. Nichols. I mean, they're doing great. I mean, yeah. I hate that my man Mark Sluster is struggling this year because <laughs> he got to the tournament not that long ago. But. Uh, Real quick, you're calling Nichols games, yeah. so they're doing well? Yeah, Nichols is, is, is a really cool story. You see Tavon Sadler there, youngest head coach of the country, turned 29 last week. Nichols has hired the youngest coach in the country in back-to-back -back cycles. Austin Claunch before him. Right. He left in the offseason. He was a sitting head coach, but he left to join NATO. It's in Alabama. Right. Alabama's doing great things. But Tavon Sadler's first head coaching job anywhere. Nichols is 11-4 and four in the conference. They're tied for second. If you get one of the top two seeds in the South and they stagger the bracket, you get the double bye to the semifinals. So the Colonels, who haven't been to the tournament, since 1998, if they can get one of those top two seeds, they're two wins away from making the NCAA tournament. That'd be quite the story for. We Tavon got some Sadler. Nichols love in everybody. Come on, <laughs> Thibodeau, give it up. Hey, the SEC. Uh, you mentioned Alabama. Uh, they are scoring 100 like it's nothing, yeah. and this is not the pros. That's not easy to do. Uh, they got 117 scored against them this week in Kentucky. But LSU, I want to mention them because LSU took a program. Matt McMahon took over with nothing, right? And they 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 had a very rough first season. They just had two wins. That was the one at South Carolina when they beat the 11th ranked uh, Gamecocks on the road. And they came back and stunned Kentucky, who had just beaten uh, 
who they they just beat Auburn yeah. at Auburn. Yeah. So the SEC is kind of crazy. And they're, they're, at one point they were saying there was definitely going to be nine teams, potentially ten. That might be pared down to maybe eight. I don't know what it is now. But the SEC is pretty darn strong. I mean, it's known as a football conference. They're doing great things in basketball as well. Yeah, no, it's it's a really good conference always. I, I think people underrate it because they think SEC, they think football. But over the last few years, yeah, it really has developed. I, say, I mean, it's now been a while, obviously, for Kentucky. But the LSUs of the world and what uh, what Alabama's done. I mean, Nate Alabama, Oates is, Auburn, Tennessee. Nate, Nate, Oates is, now, Nate Oates has done a remarkable job. I mean, people forget Bruce Pearl and Auburn. I mean, they were that this close to a national title game back in 2019, that year that with the uh, It took an incredible Virginia, play by Virginia. And, 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 well, well, they had, well, they had the at the end and then right. the corner on Kyle Guy. But right. no, I, I think that the job that Nate Oates has done at Alabama has been amazing. I mean, the, the consistency over at Tennessee and what they've been able to do, I think, with Rick Barnes, I mean, that's obviously that it goes that's for it. So the only solid. thing they haven't done really is make a Final Four. I right. mean, they, they're knocking on that door every single year. I think, you know, Kentucky, they've had some struggles this year, obviously, but, but they Kentucky. just they just they just lit it up against Alabama at home. I think LSU, you know, it's interesting. Matt McMahon, so much success at the mid-major level. We know yeah. what he did at Murray State and, and, the, and the job that he did there and um, all the success that he's had I think he's got a, a talented group they've obviously you know I mean, Jalen Cook for instance who they got from Tulane they had to wait out the waiver process and, and get him right and, and he's been and hurt ha- for he's, a minute he's now. been yeah. injured now right. after believing them in scoring they've got you know a, a guy like Jordan Wright all these transfers who've come out and they're trying Let, to act like them. Gary Smith he does lead him in scoring we know <laughs> <laughs> Gary was talking about Jalen the other day like it was his brother I know you know we love Jalen but uh you know he's had some issues over the years that's why he's transferred to no no but I'm Julian, just saying but, I think LSU's got some pieces right. for sure they're the kind of team that in the in a SEC tournament it's going to be hard where they are net wise do they have enough quality wins for that large it's going to be tough to but can they the make tournament a tough but yeah. they have those four quad one wins oh, yeah, I mean, yeah that's impressive but I'm saying can is that a team that you don't want to be facing in March absolutely they have the kind of pieces where I mean you saw what they what they did in that home game against Kentucky at the end I mean they've got veteran guys who in March it's the kind of group you want to have so SEC is going to be fascinating to watch well it's correct. crazy you know obviously the stat of the year for college basketball has been the the unranked teams beating, you know, ranked teams that go on the road, right? And it's always been 80 to 85 percent. And all of a sudden this year, it's 45 percent those teams winning. It's been crazy. Unranked home teams are just beating the dog out of the uh, the teams that come out that are ranked. Yeah. So what is your take on this? And obviously I hear NIL or whatever, and I hear transfer portal, but what's your take on it? Yeah, I mean, a college basketball is in an interesting spot, obviously, with all the all the new rules. And I think it's in, you know, they had the mid-year, the mid-year waiver rules change. We were talking about Will Wade and kind of what happened with his 10-game suspension to start the year. I think that's the only reason why he's not in the you know, National Coach of the Year conversations because of the time missed. But, no, I mean, it's in an interesting place. I think there's, as far as NIL goes, it's, you know, I'm kind of like, I'm sometimes hit or miss on how I feel about it with the way that, you know, certain athletes get benefited and kind of the way that it, it leads to the transfer portal and that sort of thing sometimes. But at the end of the day, I think that because of the transfer portal, you've got so much parity in college hoops, which is it amazing. Keeps everybody honest, right? It does. And you really can, you know, what's amazing, I think, for me to watch, we were talking about the SEC, just an example for you. Lamont Paris in South Carolina picked near the bottom, yeah, of, the, I love this team. bottom of the SEC. I love that team. I called a couple games for them on CBS yeah. Sports Network earlier in the year. Here they are near the top of the SEC because you really Reload the transfer portal. All of a sudden, overnight, forget about preseason projections. Look at South Florida and the American. You get right. a new coach, you get the transfer one. portal, and boom. Two guys that should be considered some coach of the year. South yeah. Carolina, if you watch their game, Lamont they Paris. play great defense. Yeah. Hey, by the way, two lanes campus, right by it. There's just Delachaise and Chase Delachaise. This is on Maple Street. Two of these, go enjoy yourself, get a couple <laughs> lunches or get one dinner. Hey, task performance, I know you don't know much about him, but you better ask somebody because that's a two-lane guy that started it. This is the softest stuff. Go ahead and yeah. throw away your Nike drive fit. Throw yeah, away your Under Armour because that's it. I'll take it. I, yeah. I, I appreciate you a ton. I'm always looking for new gear, and I'm always looking for a good meal around and here. And head so. coach Jay Ullman brought me that helmet last okay. week because we've been using the old ones. <laughs> a ton of signatures, the old the old logo. So my, my two-lane friends, go ahead and sign. That's what we're going. You're putting you on it. You're an uh, announcer. Uh, okay. Sign yeah, the please. top of that thing on the back, you know, right yeah, there. Yeah, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a signature on the back. How about there that? There it is. Wherever you want, man. We're not <laughs> equal, we're like equal opportunity signatures around here. Hey, I got a lot of people to thank in the back. We have a new person I want to welcome on board. That's Jane. Welcome on to the Primetime Sports Show. And, of course, my producer, Will Hill, the best in the business. I'm telling you that right now. Logan Graffia, Alex Jacone, and, of course, Danielle as well. Wick, that's right. Hey, I want to thank Jim and, and Ron, of course, at WLE. We're going to continue having great shows. March is around the corner. That means March Madness. Can't wait. Stay tuned for more on Primetime Sports.
Hi, this is Charles Marcella. Tune in each week to WLA-TV for Celebrating Culture as I travel the highways and byways of Louisiana, meeting the people and visiting the places that make our state great. From Grand Isle to Shreveport, with stops in between, Celebrating Culture gives viewers a chance to explore and experience our rich history along with the food, festivals, and fun. Join me on my journey as we highlight music, art, coastal activities, and so much more. Watch Celebrating Culture, Sunday nights at 9 p.m., only on WLAE. Hello, I'm Norman Robinson. Join me every Tuesday night of the month at 9.30 for Affordable Housing Matters, a show developed to educate the viewers in the New Orleans metro area with step-by-step -step basics of home ownership. Every show, we will bring in leaders and representatives to discuss topics such as credit counseling, home buyer training, mortgage lending, property insurance, fair housing practices, and so much more. Again, that's Tuesday nights at 9.30, right here on WLAE. Watch WLAE Digital Broadcast Channel 32.3 for Catholic TV offering programming relevant to Catholic viewers, including live religious services, Vatican events, talk shows, devotional programs, educational entertainment, and children's programs. Hi, I'm Father Cedric Pizzania, the host of Live With Passion. It is such a joy and a privilege to be reaching out to the folks in the New Orleans area, as I have been for many years with my program, Live With Passion. My motto is touching lives and saving souls. I want you to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you to become the best that you can be, and I want to reach out beyond the walls of the church. I hope you'll tune into my program on Sundays and Mondays. Don't just live, live with passion. You're watching WLAE, New Orleans Public Television.